is organizing this series of webinars on the future of work and um, with, with the many different themes and trying to choose the specialists we're going to call for each of those talks very, very carefully uh, with a lot of uh, intention. Uh, and this one, as, you, as you've read in the webinar invitation, is about the age of participation. So welcome everybody who's interested in that theme. Uh, and participation, of course, is in the crux of those, uh, this new movement, those new ways of working. Um, it invites uh, a lot of questions that we are doing our best uh, to be the generation that, um, that solves those puzzles. Uh, what does it mean to activate the collective intelligence of a group? Is there any way to invite people with different personalities to a middle ground of collaboration? Is in this current world we're living, where, where we see this whole crisis of meaning, can we find trust in the work environment? And if so, how? So those very broad, very tangly questions uh, are some of the things that we're gonna explore today. I'm your host, Jorian. Uh, and with me, I have Manel, who is a WeShare connector and a collective intelligence consultant. We have Elena, who is a facilitator, co-host of the Practical Self-Management Intensive Course and um, steward of the Greater Than Academy. And we have Stefan, uh, who is the co-founder of Income Professional Services Cooperative and uh, founder uh, and principal of um, Working Together Consulting. Um, we also have Miriam taking care of the tech issues. So it, it's, by the way, if you're experiencing any sort of uh, tech complications, you can DM her. That would be the fastest way to get it solved. Um, and we chose these three people because we wanted minds that are in the field of participation, dealing with real world problems and challenges and opportunities that are, are present uh, in, in many companies, in many work groups right now. Uh, and for this call, if you've participated on the other calls, especially, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, it felt a bit ironic to to do a webinar about participation and not allow people to participate <laughs> so uh we're gonna break them all a little bit and we will have uh, a, a moment of participation it's still a webinar okay but we'll have a very special moment in the middle um so i'm gonna start right now with the with the one big question that i hope is like very spicy and and um introduces a lot of those questions, a lot of those doubts uh, to everyone that's present. And then we're going to do our exercise for eight minutes. Uh, after that, I'm going to start asking a bit, about, uh, a bit more on the practical side of things, of tips and tricks and strategies that you folks can use um, tomorrow in your own work. Maybe you'll get some nuggets of knowledge that is immediately useful. And I have more prepared but honestly, what I would like after this moment of, of, of practical knowledge is to have your questions. So I'll be checking the chat the whole uh, process. Please send your questions, send your comments. I'm going to try to uh, grab all this lovely collective knowledge that we are also going to produce here. Uh, and just so you know, uh, we, we schedule those calls for one hour. But just after that, we have a half an hour. It's more chill. The mics start to get open, it's more um, laid back. So if you have this extra half an hour, you're also invited to stay here with us for a little longer. Um, so with that introduction, let me ask my big question. Uh, folks, I, I spent like one, one week thinking like, what is my spiciest question? So I'm, I'm very <laughs> excited. Um, so, uh, our invitation is all about new approaches to participation, right? So when you three uh, think about participation in the workplace, what are the invisible forces that you believe should be made visible? And whoever wants to start? We knew the question beforehand, we have to say this. <laughs> But yeah, um, I'd like to open. Um, uh, when also, we discussed what we meant by participation, right? In terms of 
is this uh, in, uh, right now, like when we come together and we do something specifically synchronously right now, or when we are doing, doing something more spanning of a period of time where we want to mobilize groups of people uh, around a certain objective, no? a certain um, project. Maybe. So I think in, in both cases, but particularly more when, when it is more like a movement or the building of a movement, I think the combination of fear and trust are two key invisible forces, invisible forces that, that often don't get acknowledged enough and especially um, people who are starting these movements uh, sometimes forget that it, we can design to actually dissipate a lot of fear and to build a lot of trust, right? So as a designing of a movement, those two forces will be the ones I'd like to, to open up with. Maybe my colleagues want to pick up on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up. Um, I think, uh, I think that that fear and trust aspect is really an interesting one to, to start with. And then I'm also seeing in, in chat here, like a lot around power and influence and all of these, um, different things that I think are associated with that. And so, uh, probably for me a big one in the context of those ideas is the archetypes that we're bringing to that space. Um, Anne Linnea and Christina Baldwin talk about this a lot in their book, uh, The Circle Way, um, uh, the, the triangular archetype, which it's a hierarchy, uh, and then the circular archetype, which is um, not that, it's a little flatter, uh, but it's not easy to just step right into a circular archetype, especially if you're coming into that circle with a ton of baggage from all of these other hierarchical spaces that uh, you know many of us, except for those of us who are maybe homeschooled on awesome communes, um, many of us come from institutionalized learning settings. We come from jobs with bosses. Um, and so stepping into a space where suddenly we're trying to dismantle that triangular shape actively by being in more of a circle, uh, I think is where a lot of uh, fear and tension um, and projection uh, arise. So, so all of those things relate in my mind. And, and it, it is about stepping out of a certain kind of archetype around power into a, a different archetype around power. And I think sort of pinging off of that, combining, I guess, the element of power and also the element of fear to some degree, um, and I'm really enjoying what everyone's adding in in the chat. I think that um, kind of picking up on what Brittany's saying, disagreement being okay, like making that really, really visible um, and encouraging it and knowing that that's a big part of what allows us to find better, more meaningful solutions, that we're going to look at things from different perspectives, but unearthing them and having them explicitly talked about is really important. But I think kind of underneath all of that is to make visible that people have different needs and different ways of participating. So if we think about how to make something more participatory, um, to think not just from the perspective of what do I need and what would make it easier for me to participate, but how can we give multiple people different ways in? So that can be as simple as like, make sure that you give people opportunities to both speak and write because some people have different ways of, of thinking of getting their, their ideas out there. Um, so that's maybe one that's a bit important for me. I, I read from Lorraine that she mentions openness to change. That is um, the whole openness. So similar to, obviously when we talk about the, the, the archetypes that, that Stefan was mentioning, Obviously, we are more familiar. We have more labels for that, and we can think, "Oh, what kind of what kind of uh, group of people is this? Are we more hierarchical? Or, you know, whatever." We could discuss that, but that will be a whole other webinar. But so governance, you know. But then things like openness, trust, sharing, you know, the, the caring, uh, all these things, they seem for for some people somehow it it seems like they are like softer which I don't think they are softer, they're actually harder. But anyway, some people call them softer. And, and then because they're softer, 
they think that we cannot be deliberate about that, we can, that we cannot be intentional. And on the contrary, I think precisely those particular areas which are less tangible or handleable, as I've seen here as well, uh, the more the reason for, for us as designers, because we see ourselves as designers, maybe that's another question, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we, could, we could be intentional about how to go about this. No? And maybe we, if we want today, we can talk a bit about that as well. Um, but definitely they're not softer, not in my experience. I just want to slightly combine what you just said, Manal, with what James Priest has just mentioned in the chat, this notion of vulnerability and like actually being open about what is going on and even how that design process went through as you, I don't know, designed a workshop or a longer participatory process, like being really explicit about why are you doing this and also inviting in your own vulnerability of like, I don't really know what's happening right now. I'm going with the flow. Like, you know, I'm thinking about moments where we might be um, whispering out loud with a co-host and like inviting people into that. Um, I actually think it encourages more people to be that way themselves, that kind of modeling of behavior that you want to encourage. Wow, the comments are really full on. So, so good. So purpose, purpose and values also. Right? Are they tacit acts? They can be explicit, and they can be. We, we you can we can invest time to actually make sense of the of the the purpose, how we define the purpose, and what are the values that represent us. And if we spend time to make them explicit, I don't know if I can say that. So th the translation from tacit to explicit, right? If we translate it into explicit, then then that leads us to the lead us to the famous autonomy and alignment, right? Which is which we've all been talking about for a while. And, and one could argue that achieving healthy levels of autonomy and healthy levels of alignment is the, the, the key substract to, to make any uh, participatory collective intelligence endeavor successful, at least the way I see it. Don't know if you agree with that one. You know, whole autonomy and alignment is, is already quite well, well discussed, no? but, but it is the how to achieve that that really interests me and how different groups are achieving things like that. And, and lately I've been fascinated by, by Bellingcat, uh, which is, uh, many of you know, is, is this, what is it, a collective of investigative journalists? No, investigative citizens. Uh, and how they manage to do amazing work with very little structures very, very nimble structures. And I think their purpose and the how they do things and the values that represent them is for me that the, the, I find is the, 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 the key to their success. Um, but maybe in the second part, no, on the more practical things, we can, we can do this back again. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, all, this is already quite fascinating what's emerging here uh, based on some of our earlier thinking and then also what's coming up in chat as well. I, I want to zero in on, on something that really struck me as kind of an invisible force or a underlying something, je ne sais quoi, of an interaction. And it's um, this notion of presence that Nanad mentioned. In a lot of ways, you know, what is participation? We, we think of participation as, okay, we're all kind of being able to be there. We're, we're spreading out, talking as much as possible. We're spreading out um, authority, power, uh, the ability to generate ideas and have them uh, explored by your peers. Like all of that is, is part of participation, but the implicit flip side of that is presence is listening, it's, it's taking in, right? So the age of participation in a way is also the age of listening. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. And then there's, uh, Lily is mentioning, okay, how about like, isn't anything that isn't explicit, would that not be uh, part of this kind of invisible forces 
piece? Like what, what is the invisible forces piece? I think that's a really interesting question to ask ourselves um, because we make up all sorts of ideas in the moment, especially about what may or may not be happening. That's where we, you know, our fears may set in and we start projecting on others. Oh, they're thinking this, they're maybe thinking that. So invisible forces could be invisible in that sense, but I'm curious to hear what, uh, what Elena and Manel think about that. Sorry, I wasn't really listening. What was that? <laughs> no, I think- For those think of you, know, you who you don't know, know Manel, he lives in the full archetype a lot of the time. <laughs> Sorry, you know, the, the age of listening. Of course, I had to say that. No, totally, totally. And you know, something that we were talking before is what, when we talk about participation, are we talking about no, uh, how did you say that? I don't know. I guess that there's like different, it's, it's such a broad word that encompasses so many things. And so you can think about it, or at least I tend to think about it as happening at different levels of scale, right? So you can think about participation happening in a moment. Um, I'm hoping that we'll do, we'll dive into more participatory, but I, even just the fact of how much engagement there is in the chat means that we're responding to what people are saying. So that's a, a kind of, um, feedback loop in a way. So there's this, the, what happens at a moment level that can be embedded and kind of like spun out to happen at like a ritual practice, like things that happen over and over again, they almost become habits. And then there's the kind of bigger scale of like a participatory movement or like, uh, you know, that has a way of being that is directed towards change in a very pointed way, but we can do that across different ways. And what I guess what we were talking about earlier was I think often everyone's really, really focused on like, you know, doing these really big participatory processes, which are amazing, but can they ever be sustained without having those participatory moments and those participatory rituals and practices? Like starting from the really small things and making that a real habit of how we interact with people. And I think that's where the listening is often not thought about because we're like, okay, what can we get from people? How can we make people say things or interact? It's like actually inviting people to really listen and doing that ourselves is, I think one of the most important starting points. Right, so there is the moment and the movement. No, when we, when we came to this conversation before the actual uh, session, the, I came a lot with, when we talked about the age of participation, I was thinking the movement, right? The, 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 the long-term interactions that will be filled up with moments, right? Of synchronous moments. But there's gonna be like lots of people working around a worthy mission for a long period of time, you know? And I, I think that's, that the, the, the moment, the how we show up when we meet, uh, or when we hopefully meet in real life one day, uh, that's, that's very important. And there is, there is so much to it, right? There is so much to it. And then there is the whole thing about the, the, the movement that has also a whole of different set of skills and tricks and so on. And I'm more interested in the long-term one. And, and, and obviously they fill up with, with, uh, with, with lots of meetings and showing up as pro properly. Stefan, I'm wondering if you could give a couple words around liberating structures in this context, because I feel like they're a really great unifying. Uh... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, well, while, while we've been chatting here, I've been thinking about that quite a bit that, uh, you know, in, in the liberating structures uh, space, we talk a lot about um, microstructures which, uh, you know, they contrast to macro structures, which are like rooms, um, big organizational policies, highly visible constraints that we're operating within all the time and that are quite large, large containers for how we interact. Um, but we rarely think about how we interact at the micro level, the microstructural level, which is these tiny little habitualized, routinized practices we have for gathering together. Um, like the presentation, a PowerPoint presentation is a perfect example of uh, something that we don't really think about. We don't trouble that as like a form of using our time together, you know, that maybe should be questioned, unpacked and creatively played with. So I think microstructures in terms of invisible forces, I mean, th those are um, quite primary for me as a, 
as a practitioner of interaction design, whatever that means. Um, because once you start to see that you're inhabiting them all the time, and even like in this webinar, we're feeling frustrated, like, ah, oh, it's a webinar about participation. Like, how is that even, <laughs> we're, in, we're, you know, we're in the, we're in the mode of uh, this kind of triangular shape of presenting down to people, right? Um, uh, so, so beginning to come into a space of self and situational awareness around these habitualized, routinized practices opens up the space for creativity in relationship to them, which is, you know, why you have 33 liberating structures plus all of the liberating structures that are in development uh, at various stages of testing, because you can start to see like, we can tweak this, we can try this, we can invite people to do this, we could have people go and do that. And what happens? I mean, it's a different outcome each time. So yes, absolutely, totally. Can we call this social technology? I think, I think someone was mentioning uh, that we haven't mentioned technology yet, but so people mentioned refer to so as to liberating structures as a social technology, so social tech. <laughs> I don't know if that's acceptable, but I quite like it, social tech. And uh, okay, so connecting to the original force that which is building trust and, and how we can design for trust, obviously the use of, of uh, formats like liberating structures to actually establish a culture, no, or, or how we do things here uh, that uh, you know um, encourages the creation of, of bonds of trust between people that, that is super powerful, I find, especially in the, in the early phases of any movement, absolutely. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm reading really Mike a lot. <laughs> I, I want to get rope trust because uh, I, I was I was waiting for that actually <laughs> because we want to address address the irony that is to talk about top down about participation, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and and here's the challenge we had when we were when we were preparing this webinar: uh, how to give you something that is not the most basic participation of all. That is something a little more, but also not something arcane, something complicated that would require a lot of technologies and all that. Um, so we decided to go with the most fundamental uh, piece of what we believe are those um, uh, rituals around participation and around building trust between people in the workplace. And we added an extra challenge to this very foundational practice, which most of you probably know, the check-in. Uh, and the check-in is underestimated. It can be incredibly powerful, even though on a day-to-day -day -day basis, you will use it in a very traditional manner. And you just ask people how they are and give them the space to be themselves. But we wanted to spice it up here. We want a space for you to build trust. We want to create a human to human contact right here so you can have a true experience. Um, and it's very important for me to mention this is an opt in, um, opt in experiment. If you want to participate on that, it will last for eight minutes and you'll be sent to breakout rooms. You need to rename yourself. Uh, you do that by putting the mouse on top of your picture on Zoom, clicking the three little dots on the top right, and rename yourself. Uh, and add the number one before your name. Uh, if you are uncomfortable with this sort of experiment, that's absolutely fine. We'll have a whiteboard here. We'll make some beautiful Zoom graffiti and it will be lovely. Um, <laughs> uh, and this is um, the invitation. Can you up your trust level by one notch? Can you challenge yourself to trust and be trusted with a completely unknown person from this call right here, right now. And we're going to give you a guide question and also a couple of things that you need to reflect on. What are you experiencing when you are listening, when you are talking? What are the feelings that are running through you? It is crucial that you just don't ask and listen, but that you notice. Um, oh, I see a raised hand. Anna, do you have a question? 
Well, uh, Jorem, do you mind while well, people are deciding whether to join this eight minute exercise by changing their name? Um, I would like to ask the other panelists and everybody here whether you have brought the check in practice to a new group that didn't even know what it was. I think I imagine that most people here know what a check in and they do it regularly. But it's very interesting when you bring this to a new group. Uh, you you cut out on my end slightly. Were you asking, have we ever brought it to a, a new group without telling them? No, no, no. Or you can tell them, like, you know, what about if we do check-ins from now on, right? And try to bring that micro practice to that to that group that you're gonna be working with for a while, right? Yes. Um, for, for, for myself, I've done it in different ways, uh, sometimes with, uh, with clients in a tacit kind of implicit way without being super explicit and just inviting us, oh, let's check in uh, for a few minutes here. Um, you know, how are we arriving to this call today is like the basic one. Um, and funnily enough, it just kind of picked up and started to snowball. And that was just every other meeting, just that became something that we all expected in that client call. And then in other spaces, being more explicit about it um, has been key. And it trans it's transformed. It's transformed those relationships in all the settings that I've used it. Absolutely. I'm looking at Sarah that she said it's awkward. And that, that's true. I also found groups that they've found it awkward. And, and it's, it's, it's hard. It's a shame because we want to bring in certain micro practices, but the culture, right? The culture is like, well, if I say this, I'm going to expose myself the fear, right? Or, or, you know, it just makes it difficult. And sometimes these micro practices, they just drop. People don't, don't carry on. My experience recently is that they, they, this group in particular was confusing check-in with sort of, how they call it, icebreaker. They thought it was an icebreaker, right? And I guess the, the point that we want to make today that this, this micro practice in particular can be so powerful for many reasons. It's not just the icebreaker, which obviously it is an icebreaker, but it's in terms of how you show up and how do you talk about yourself and you, 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 you as a you all the things of life that they don't know because we just we just work together right um it's a it's a very powerful um practice and I, I wonder the people that came to this talk they're probably all familiar with this but can can you say it on the chat if you also find it awkward in your space or not Write an A if you find it awkward in your group. <laughs> I remember bringing check-ins to this group that thought check-ins were stand-ups and people would immediately talk about their tasks. Uh, and I needed to be incredibly personal in my check-in for them to get the spirit of it. And, and I don't think I would be that personal. And uh, I have not, no problem with being personal, but I had to like, I couldn't talk about my, my breakfast. I needed to talk about my feelings and they, they would get to the end of it, but it took a good six tries. <laughs> so I think people, so, so quite a few people have a one on their name. Well, quite a lot of them. All right, I think um, we're, we're ready to start and let me fetch you the question. Just a second here, many windows open. Um, oh, just before, if you happen to be alone, if there's any technical issue or something, uh, everybody has the power to come back to the main room. You, you'll find a button over there. We can send you to a new breakout room. Or if you're feeling that you really want to explore the inners of yourself, you can also spend some time there feeling the discomfort of being alone in the breakout room and asking yourself, how does that make you feel? Don't check your emails. Don't check your social media. Just check your heart. 
Um, the question I'm going to give to you is, when was the last time you felt truly heard in a group setting? Truly heard. What happened? And why was that important? We're going to send you again this question as soon as you're in the breakout room so you don't have to memorize it. But um, I would also invite you that as soon as you get to the uh, breakout, spend a little time in silence. It can be 30 seconds before you start answering. Notice, OK? This is an eight minute exercise. And I'll see you here at the very end. <clears throat> I think the big advantage is now that uh, think about this. Think what absurd thing I'm about to say is that well being is trendy. Um, I had horrible experiences um, proposing things to people. Um, uh, maybe seven years ago, but they were not ready for anything. Uh, it's fine. I was working with the oil company. It was horrible. Oh my god! Uh, but um, I, uh, if I propose anything about games, by the time people would be very excited um, because that was the trendy thing. The whole gamification conversation was just starting. But um, now, if you propose meditation, you're you're in, and. You know, th there's a power and cool that we don't recognize. Oh, we got 20 seconds left, folks. OK, folks, yeah, I'm going to close the breakout rooms now. So within 30 seconds, people will be coming back in. Do your last little doodles. Um, does somebody, I always do the wrong buttons, but screenshot? I think I've saved it as a PNG as well, but let's get as many as we can. <laughs> yeah, screenshot yeah. as well. Shift command three is screenshot. <laughs> Thank you. I think people are back, no? I think people are back, yeah. Hello, everyone. We hope you had a lovely conversation. Whilst you were out in your breakout rooms, we did another slight different participatory practice that's more playful and embodied. So we just did some doodling together. Um, Trey, I'm back over to you. Yes. Um, cool. Uh, I hope those were wonderful conversations you had. and. I do hope that you remember to, to notice what we're going through your minds and bodies. Um, but we also want those talks, not only this talk, but this whole series of GT talks uh, to be about the practicality of things. So this is the moment that I wanna bring a little bit of that. Um, so you, you three who are um, especially consulting with so many different companies, works and groups, uh, do you have um, something to give us on two particular moments that are vital to participation, that are the, the building blocks of participation? Invitations and structures. So, of course, uh, one doesn't work without the other. You need to invite people to participate on some, in, in some way. Uh, so I'm interested in both those things. Uh, if we could start with invitations, which feels correct chronologically and then we go to the structures do you have any tips and tricks on how to invite people to collaborate i didn't want to be the guy who was tanned again but you know you had the chance but okay so the one the, the tip i chose about the invitation there is much to be said about invitation right but uh, for me is when we invite people to join our movement no? or to join whatever is it that we, we're trying to do, if 
if it comes with a clear time frame, so they, they, we, you, they don't feel scared. So they know that it's time box in a way that they can join, for example, like join this call today, right? It's a talk, we're gonna talk about the age of participation, but you know, it's for an hour, right? So that's, it, it's easier to, to, to say, yes, I can invest that time or not, right? And often in many invitations for many great things like zero waste or Barcelona, or, you know, there are many interesting movements out there. They don't have clear invitations that are time boxed, right? So if we had invited you to come to a talk and we don't say how long it's going to be, fewer people would naturally be inclined to, to join. So, so small invitations for a clear time frame is my recommendation. I have more, but I'll, I'll keep them for later. I think that, that that's not just at a movement level, if I'm really honest. Like, I think even when you're inviting someone into a very micro practice, like clear, what are you invited into as clear as can be? And what time do you have? And I think that kind of, to me, goes back to one of the starting blocks of most facilitation. And it's very explicit within liberating structures in the name, right? Like you give enough, you give the bare bones of scaffolding around which people can be creative or participatory or engaged. Um, and I think especially in transition moments, right? Like if we're, we're quite used to being in hierarchical states where it's like, okay, someone's gonna tell me what to do. I'm just gonna go in there and do it. Like peeling back those layers a little bit more slowly. So it's like, I'm still gonna give you something, but then you've got to figure out. And I kind of, yeah, that's that notion of confusiasms and allowing people to trust the process. So inviting people explicitly being like, you might feel a little bit confused when you get there. That's okay. Um, so kind of giving that permission for be being in that space of fear and a bit of confusion so that they can then step in knowingly. Maybe that's a tackling the fear space. I think, um, I think another big one uh, in relationship to that is being mindful as the facilitator of your own power. As much as you might be trying to say like, oh, I'm just, you know, particularly in ways that we might not be too self-aware about, for instance, for example, um, when setting up the invitation, using an example, like modeling too hard or too specifically related to the question you're asking people to go away and think on, um, does not produce an interesting output at the end of that conversation because people go away and they're just repeating what you said in their paired conversations or their trios or whatever. Like, yeah, I really liked, you know, when Stefan uh, exemplified how to do this. I mean, that was, that was pretty, that's the same for me. Yeah. And so then everybody comes out for breakout and it's just people, this, this sea of people suddenly repeating back to you what you gave them as an example. So when setting up the invitation, keeping that confusiasm there a little bit right not not getting too specific if you're modeling how to do the exercise not being too not being too specific with an example that's related to the work that people are there to do but maybe something completely different that's more metaphorical that's more um aphoristic almost you know uh it's so that people don't entrain to your ideas because whether you like it or not, there's all of these projections. We're coming in with these hierarchical archetypes and that, that can reproduce itself in ways where we don't even really intend to. So I, I'm obviously the guy on the movement parts, and the, the, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue making the case. So for, for those projects that want to mobilize hundreds of people around a particular purpose over a period of time, like a stakeholder engagement projects or community projects, or whatnot, I, I, always, <clears throat> I always find very useful these uh, four ingredients that I'm going to put here in the chat. Uh, when, when I look at any of my projects, I always think of these, of the quantities of these four ingredients, right? So the openness, and the, I find the invitation is in here, right? So how, how open, uh, what are we opening up for and to what extent? Right. Then I look at informality, <clears throat> informality in order to build trust. So how am I going to design for trust building? And I always use the example of <clears throat> the image that we have the businessmen playing golf together, right? That, that is a space 
of informality that works for them to build trust, right? So for my project, what is my equivalent? And that's what I mean by informality. Then culture of experimentation, so really make it safe, you know, based on that trust that we, we just mentioned, to try things and to and to evolve through the trying. And, and once we've been trying and we are learning, right? Like how do we share? How do we work out loud? So we share all that knowledge, which will make more people discover this movement or this project, and then you close the loop. You know? So once they discover it, there is a call to action or a way to participate. If you like this, come to this meeting, or if you like this, I don't know, do this other thing, right? So that's the openness. And this, this cycle is the one that generates the momentum and traction and the, and the collective intelligence, really. I, I find these four ingredients uh, useful for me. I'm tempted to jump to the structures. Any last comments on invitations? Because I'm also liking that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you've invited people. Let's assume that uh, you've made a wonderful invitation that you found the heart of the group. Um, then um, do you have any uh, tips and tricks or, or best practices? Uh, how do you create good design scaffoldings? How do you create those structures for participation? Also, red flags are useful if you have any to point out. Like, mm, if I see this, mm. I mean, I, I want to answer your question, Jorian, but I also want to answer the really lovely question from Claire in, in chat as well. So I'll briefly, just a very small answer to your question, Jorian. I'm sorry. Just It's just small. <laughs> um, clarity of purpose. Like, why are we gathering? Why are people coming together? Um, once that's clear to the folks who are designing that interaction, that participatory action, things kind of fall into place. Um, different possibilities fall into place about what you can do together and what makes sense. Um, and so here for Claire, this is perfect, right? Like this is a perfect example of that. So she is saying that there's this invitation to the age of participation um, and kind of almost a bigger question, what makes it possible today to legitimize participation and its development? How do you think, sorry, what do you think makes it essential and powerful? And uh, for me, like, that question of legitimizing participation as a mode of practice and, and why that's essential. I mean, it, it, it comes down to the fact that, you know, we're this, this uh, I think we, we mentioned it briefly in the email copy or somewhere, but this VUCA world, this volatile and certain um, complex world that we're in, uh, we can't tackle those challenges, uh, those, um, problems, those opportunities, however you want to re reframe those, we can't tackle them with just a group of experts. It doesn't make any sense. We need to match the complexity of those challenges, of those group dynamics, whatever the case may be, with uh, diverse, divergent ideas, opinions, so on and so forth. That's kind of the necessity. That's what legitimizes participation. But it's difficult to see that if we're still stuck in that triangular mindset about things where we need to have a boss who's making decisions. We need to have the experts come in and tell us what to do, blah, 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 right? And that applies at the small, you're just interacting in the office level all the way up to the level of movements. Um, we want movements to be more inclusive, diverse. We want them to uh, have all sorts of perspectives in them um, to be able to tackle these, these challenges. We need all these ideas. We need all of us to come and wrestle them. Um, can I just point out two important things? First, I just realized that we are two minutes to the hour. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this call, we will hang out here for a while now. Uh, so if you do have the time, uh, you're invited to stay with us. It's a little more informal after the first hour. And, um, and the, the, if you can't, the recording will be online on YouTube shortly. Um, but for the folks who want to stay, uh, this is the moment that we also like to open the mic. And since Stefan jumped into Claire's question, 
uh, and gave such an interesting um, such an interesting perspective on that. Uh, Claire, do you mind if I invite you to join us and talk a little bit about this interesting feeling and this question that you propose here? Can you give us a little more of yourself? If that's cool. You muted. Oh, uh, you you muted. Oh, come on. Ah, there you go. Oh no, muted again. Oh, muted. <laughs> Claire, Claire, you're muted. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, oh uh, no, you're muted. We don't hear you. But you're so expressive. I wish I could. <laughs> uh, Why don't you oh, hear her? I can't hear her. Me neither. No. Is even no, Claire. You have to unmute you on the on the Zoom platform. Yes. Uh, right. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes. I I I think it could be interesting to. Uh, to think about uh, the title of the webinar, the age of participation. I think, and I, uh, I think that all of us think we are in the age of participation, but uh, how to explain this? How to speak about um, the need and the powerful mm -hmm. of participation with people that don't think, uh, it, it, that think that participation is weight of times, it's uh, just uh, in mode uh, tendance, a train or something. Do you understand what I say? <laughs> Please help me. <laughs> it, it, it is a bit of a fad right now, that, that is for sure like maybe 20 years ago, sustainability was a, a trend or something, right? And yes. it, sometimes it did more damage than good, right? Because it made the, the, the concept void of meaning. But I don't know, maybe because I'm in this bubble and I see this bubble growing, uh, I'm thinking that it's gonna stick. I think, I think I'm starting to see meaningful change in how people work and show up at work, right? And people stop thinking of, work and life and it's all I think it's all getting uh, mixed up enough uh, to, so it will stick maybe I'm too optimistic yes I you, what, what do you other think I think it's real I think it's meaningful change mm -hmm. I hope so otherwise what are we doing <laughs> hopefully so mm -hmm. hopefully so and uh, lots of people like I see in this in this zoom call as well we left our traditional work positions that we used to call traditional and we moved into this space and now when I look back at those organizations I start seeing that they are changing as well right so that's that's also looking good what is your experience Claire my experience in English <laughs> uh, we have people who can translate no 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding. In English <laughs> Je reste persuadé. I think that uh, every people who experienced, a fait, qui a fait l'expérience de la participation, never come back, or don't want to come back to the. Uh, l'expérience est clé. L'expérience est nécessaire. Do you understand what I mean? The experience is the key. May for organization who don't know how to do this or how to practice, uh, how to think with participation, they don't they, they, they don't agree that we are at the age of participation. Really, it's just a word. Do you think what I mean? How to 
to explain to everybody that can be very necessary to participate, to, to have this kind of organization of relationship. Is I like what, um, maybe you can connect with a question, the comment about uh, democracy that- yes, exactly. I, I lost it right now here. Catherine Yeager, no? you mentioned, can, is participation in democracy interchangeable? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. And something that I find very interesting is that I work a lot with a co-op space, uh, especially in Spain, there's a big tradition of cooperatives. And I think there is a cultural clash there. So they, they believe they are very democratic. They believe they are very participatory. But I also believe that they are paralyzed by those, by their, their culture of what they understand as democracy. And I think participation and collaboration they, uh, are most powerful when the individual has ag agency to digress. And I think at the beginning of the session today, someone mentioned uh, alignment, but, but to some extent, too much alignment, we may lose richness and, of diversity. So I really like the groups that can work in a very divergent way, even opposing ways, but they coexist and they, they, they agree on the bigger, bigger values and bigger purpose. And they are, they are not shy of staying away from democracy, understood as a, the majority wins or consensus or these things that can be really paralyzing for for groups. Mm. And I don't know if, if Catherine, you want to share your thoughts here with us. I don't know if you're still here, maybe you left. Um, maybe she I left the question Catherine. and left. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm actually just throwing it out for discussion that um, democracy to me is a very loaded term um, because of all the political stuff. And yet in a cooperative way, it means it could be interpreted to mean participation. So I'm actually just throwing the concept out there to just get a reaction. Uh, I mean, that's, it's really an innocent question, but I think it is, it can be pretty deep too. So I'm just interested in people's opinions. I like to bring a little poetics to those conversations because, oh, we get lost in the special words, don't we? Um, and once upon a time, I heard a metaphor. It's just a metaphor. It might be wrong. We must, we must accept this. But it helped me to think about things like the age of participation or even democracy, if you think about it. Um, I've heard that uh, an egg that breaks from the outside in means death. And an egg that breaks from the inside out means life. Um, uh, very recently, I was uh, I was reading Eric Hobsbawm's *The Age of Revolutions*, uh, and he argues again. It's up for interpretation that um, the democratic system and uh, universal suffrage uh, were not chosen; they steamrolled everything else. You couldn't be a you couldn't be a king anymore because feudalism is inefficient. Uh, and I think we might be at the verge of something like that. Societies where everybody is happier than the societies that are not adopting that way. Workplaces where everybody's happier than the workplaces and nobody's adopting that element. And then suddenly the change doesn't come from an outside force inserting pressure, but from an internal desire. I also want that great thing you've got. Maybe just adding one thing uh, that I found very interesting watching at the till around the world videos. Um, answering to the question, I mean, the till reinventing organization booked um, was published 10 years ago. Why don't we see more till organization actually um, getting at uh, scaling up? And uh, I, I thought one, one of the thoughts I saw that I think what's very interesting was to say, um, while we will remain in a utilitarian paradigm, it will be extremely hard to completely move to till outside of a few initiatives that are really based on um, people's, a few people's will to enforce them. Um, 
and we we uh, and I, I think I, I I say this maybe just in the private sector because it's different than if you're in a public sector. But I found it quite interesting, like to say, if we we need to move from a utilitarian paradigm to another kind of paradigm, uh, because if you're just focusing of, on efficiency, then uh, mm -hmm. it, it's it's really. Um, something which really blocks uh, the paradigm toward more uh, so more teal companies and therefore more participation i think i'm interested uh, by you if you agree or not about it i do i yeah i i just i want to jump in because i i used to have a uh, i used to study political theory and was at that level, right? Where we're talking about paradigms, we're talking about these big things, social movements, these sorts of things. Um, and I think for me, the biggest learning over the past uh, five or seven years, having worked inside of government and then outside consulting and training and things like this, the biggest learning is what is the what is the tiny tiny thing that you can do in your life, in your system of relations right now that that shows and doesn't tell, you know, that that demonstrates what it's like to operate in this different way in our spaces of relationship. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to bring it all the way back to that, that micro level and, and just key in on what James was saying here in chat. And James, if you're still with us, please feel free to jump in. I mean, anybody feel free to jump into this conversation space here. This is, this is open. Um, I think there is something about that, right? When we think about it as multi-generational, when we see it as big beyond our lifetime, it can actually bring some level of peace because it's not our job, it's not our role to transform these paradigms, right? Like, yes, we know we need to, we, we, we see the necessity, but really maybe what our role is in these small, tiny ways is to just inject participatory practices into the different spaces that we habitually operate in. And, and those microstructures that I mentioned earlier, like just gently kind of tap at them with with a hammer and a chisel and just kind of break them apart and then in their place have a check-in uh, or in their place go on to break out with pairs and rotate through them quickly with impromptu networking or any of the other LS trying different things out right and seeing how they how they feel and then for the organizations where you really need to like convince them just come in with the funnest stuff the the most the one that's going to get everybody laughing and and feeling connected and feeling vulnerable but in a in a kind of warm inviting way right and there there are tools for doing that too so beginning to get more um more aware as a practitioner of these tools beginning to uh test them with your peers and then beginning to bring those into the field with you i think that that kind of virtuous cycle between those three is is really key um as like the tiny way that we can start to feed into that multi-generational project. I guess one super small, sorry, Dorian, um, a slightly contentious point, um, <laughs> because why not? Um, Dorian, you talked about like the shift from feudalism to industrial capitalized capitalism as like an efficiency process. But there's actually an enormous amount of coercion that happened. Like it, there was a lot. Um, there was a lot of like having to force people out of the way in which they worked to convince them that working in wage labor contexts was what they should be doing. Um, so, and I don't think <laughs> from the ethos of a participatory, collaborative, um, authentic place that would be the technique that we'd want to use, but I think that kind of actually brings us back to, to Claire's original question around like, or sort of, I guess, Claire's answer to, to your own question, which is that um, providing spaces for people to really experience something like different and giving them a sense of like, this is what could be possible 
generally tends people to want to be like, wow, okay, this is something really powerful and meaningful and allows me to be more myself and allows other people to, and we create really powerful things from that space. So it's almost like that more showing and providing an embodied experience for people to connect with, which then starts with what Stefan was saying, like you start really small and you start small also because to ask people to make that change, you can't go from here to there. That becomes way too scary. So going like the little incremental steps. Um, and there is another way to begin is what I do is with students. Uh, uh, I do a lot with students. Everything I do with them is co-construction, participation with other matter. So the experiment, it's a good way. And they are so happy. <laughs> Magdalena, I just read your comment over here, and I, I, I think it's um, just a mention of the caveat of democracy. It's uh, interesting enough. Would you like to expand upon this on the uh, on the on the voice chat? Well, let me see if you guys can see me, because I don't have my like I have something going on at home, so I was I was kind of passively. Um, listening to you guys, which is not a very good exercise, particularly in the framework of, of what we are discussing today. Um, well, it's basically the question that I that I posted in there. I feel that well, I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm an engineer, but I'm a system thinker, and I work a lot with with people. You know, like building ecosystems, right? Um, mappings and so a situation I come across very often is that like a person feeling, you know, like um, you know, rebelling against the fact that his or her voice is not that heard um, in a situation where, you know, he or she hasn't contributed to the ecosystem at all, right? This is kind of linked to what, to what I was saying before. I think, you know, democracy, like the way I understand democracy is, you know, everybody like access to, to having a voice is there for everybody. But then I think there's also a meritocratic aspect in it, right? If you contribute, right, or if you are informed, then obviously, you know, your opinion is going to have a, a bigger weight than that of somebody that is just there, you know, as a passive figure. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, this is anyway, you know, a conversation that is going over and over in different forums. But yeah, I just wanted to make that point. Not sure what you guys think about that. Oh, I love the, yeah. You need to open up the spaces for people to have power, but when they manifest too much power too quickly, uh, it's, it's also complicated, right? Um, if you open your mind too much, your brain is gonna fall out. Um, and th there's a lot of uh, personality uh, clashes, right? If you're incredibly extroverted, uh, you're more likely to take a lot of space. Um, and nobody teaches extroverted people to not take the space. Because you know, there's a lot of advantages of taking those spaces in our current society. But how do we move to the age of participation, the age that you need to listen first? I don't know. Do you folks have any uh, insights? In just one practical one. I always like to model the liberating instructor nine wise before um, uh, inviting participants to go and, and practice in their breakouts. And just that simple activity of playing roles, one person being in that interviewing stance and another person being in the interviewed stance and showing what it means to interview as a very active and engaged stance of listening and, and getting deeper with why, nine whys to be precise. And not just asking why, but saying things like, why is that important? And like, well, wait, wait, I feel like you kind of went off track here. I'm curious about why this, you know, really engaging with the partner and just modeling that in front of folks. Um, can be quite powerful. And then, and then we know how to practice that gentle interrogation 
of one another. That's just one tiny one. Well, folks, um, I've been informed that actually this room is going to be used in like five minutes. <laughs> oh, uh, the challenges of the age of participation. <laughs> Which will let other people participate in this space too. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when I mentioned that we need to carefully construct our structures? This is one of them, really. <laughs> um, but it was a lovely conversation. Thanks for everybody who came along. Remember that we have uh, we've been having those um, those talks uh, twice a month, different themes, different professionals. You might see some uh, uh, familiar faces uh, as participants, not so much as uh, as uh, as hosts and and speakers. Uh, and uh, we would love to see you folks again. Thanks for showing up. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, everyone. Hope to Thank see you soon. Everyone.